Hello, welcome to Glucksman Ireland House at New York University. My name is John Waters. I'm a professor of English and of Irish studies here at NYU, and it's my great privilege and delight to welcome you to the annual Quinlan Family Lecture in Poetry. Uh, the Quinlan Family Lecture in Poetry was endowed by Joe Quinlan in honor of Joe's father, Tom. Uh, Tom Quinlan was for more, has been for more than 60 years a teacher of poetry and of literature. Uh, for a long time in the Philadelphia public schools, but Tom has taught um, adult education, uh, all sorts of different places and perspectives um, that he's brought to the community over the years. Uh, I think we'll be lucky enough perhaps to hear from Tom, uh, who's still going strong at age 94. Um, I wish we could all be together here at Glucksman Ireland House in, on Fifth Avenue in Greenwich Village, um, but of course that can't be the case. Uh, Hopefully next year we'll all be able to gather together again. Um, we hope that everyone is staying safe and we have a wonderful program of poetry to bring to you this evening. For this year's lecture, I'm delighted to welcome my friend and colleague Nick Laird, uh, who has curated a series of readings by fellow poets as well as by several surprise guests. Um, as in past years, the Quinlan Family Lecture um, remembers and commemorates the special relationship that we've enjoyed over the years with Seamus Heaney uh, and also with Kieran Carson. Um, uh, especially this year, it's on the anniversary this month of Kieran's untimely death last October. It was Kieran, as professor of poetry at the Seamus Heaney Center at Queen's University in Belfast, who first reached out to myself and to Professor Joe Lee to see about collaborating in support of the Seamus Heaney Prize. Uh, Seamus and Mari Heaney uh, visited NYU for the official launch of the first Quinlan Family Lecture, and Seamus, in fact, spoke very memorably and very movingly on that occasion here at Ireland House. And I, I want to just close by um, thanking you all for coming, and thanking especially Seamus Heaney for, for making time in his schedule and to, to come here, and to, to grace us with your presence again, but also to, 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 for yourself and Mari to be in the door and, uh, inside the house and reminding us why we do this. Uh, why we're so lucky to do this. Um, oh, and, and, and Seamus, his, his grace is, uh, will say a few words. Thank you so much, Seamus. We're very pleased. Yeah. just thought this was much too, <coughs> too meaningful and, and emotional event to leave it like that. Um, and uh, I, Having been here early on, it is a great pleasure to come back. And I was thinking of <clears throat> coming into the Glucksman field of force here. <laughs> We've all been uh, affected by it, and the better for it. In a moment, I'll turn things over to Nick Laird. But first, I wanted to uh, recognize the warm relationship that we at Glucksman Ireland House have enjoyed over the years with our friends and colleagues at the Irish Art Center uh, under the leadership of Aidan Connolly, Pauline Turley, and Rachel Gilkey. Um, Quinlan family have been supporters both of Ireland House and of the Irish Art Center, and we've been delighted here at, at NYU to be part of the annual Poetry Fest held by the Irish Art Center every November, curated for many years by Angus Woods and Belinda McKeon and now, in recent years, curated by Nick Laird. We hope that you'll join in several of the other events of the Poetry Festival over this coming weekend. But for tonight, uh, Nick Laird is going to kick things off by introducing uh, several readings by fellow poets and a few special guests. So, Nick, over to you. Hi. Um, well, it's good to be here. Um, in London. I'm sorry that we're not all meeting together in New York as usual. But I'm glad to speak a little bit about Seamus. Um, so I wanted to talk about really when I was traveling over from London to Dublin for Seamus's funeral, I was standing at the gate in Heathrow thinking about um, Seamus obviously and what came into my mind sort of unbidden as it always does when I'm faced with um, the business end of an airport the landing strips and so on, um, is the line, the sky is tall as over a runway. It's a line from his poem The Peninsula and it's so casual and absolutely perfect that it immediately takes its place among one's own routine apprehensions of the world 
um, the way in which we experience our own lives. And I find that with Shima, so much of my mental furniture, as it were, which I'm left to forever rearrange, was manufactured by Heaney. Um, perhaps manufactured is the wrong word, because these are more like, these phrases, these perceptions are more like um, crafted objet d'art, as they say. He never made a bad line. Um, there's the sheer rightness of that physical perception, the ability to capture the thing in words. And here, off the top of my head, I think of him when he talks about potatoes and his phrase, loving the cool hardness in our hands, um, the poppy bruise, the bleb of an icicle, athletic sea light, books of braille like books wallpaper patterns came in, cockle minarets, um, any of the metaphors in the, the, the Tolland poems, you know, the grauble man, the ball of his heel like a basalt egg, the chin a visor raised above the vent of the slashed throat, all of that stuff. So there's that visual um, thing that Heaney could do so well. Um, only a small part of the achievement, obviously, configuring the visual and words. He could also perfect and explore the emotional, the political, the philological, the mythic, the domestic, anything really. And the poems of Seamus's tend to operate on several planes at once, at work in the various domains of the possible. But they exist initially in the ear, and I love him for the sonic order of the work, which when I first encountered it as a 14-year-old in Mid-Ulster, it was certainly what appealed to me first. He had a terrific ear. He worked assonance up into in a phrase from the early work, a strong gauze of sound. One of his signature patternings was a kind of triptych of assonance that tied a pentameter together. There were dozens of examples, but I think of, say, the wet centre is bottomless. When you hear that E, that short E sound repeated three times. What about once and once only I fired a gun? My foul mouth takes it out on you. So all of this very conversational um, language but has a very strong um, sonic patterning, very memorable. So there's also a kind of physical sensation to reading Heaney, a late poem in Iowa once. The phrase opens and comes back at the end of the poem, retuned, returned, try it in Iowa once. The mouth moves all the way from the back to the front in saying it. It's no coincidence the phrase is repeated and is the title of the poem, it's a kind of retuning. So I could bang on about the poetry all day, um, and it's the poetry we're left with. He was a lovely man, as anyone he met him knew. He had the twinkle of a wicked uncle and the kindness of a favoured one. When my first poetry book came out a long time ago now, he wrote to me and we became friends. You couldn't out postcard him. He was an indefatigable correspondent and a hearty host and welcomer. And also, you know, one of the greatest poets of the 20th century. The work managed to stay true to the inward impulse of the poet and the outward pressure of the time and situation. And the achievement was to be adequate to both the political and the personal. So he wrote a poetry which, in his own words, was a poetry of redress, in which readers could find succour, relief, reassurance, even hope. There's not a week goes past ever since I first encountered um, Heaney at school, a few miles from Balahi, where Ahini was born, um, that I don't read something by him. Uh, so I'm going to read um, The Harvest Bow, um, which you all know. Here's my, this is, I've got many copies of Ahini, but here's one of them. No idea where its front has gone. but So I'll read um, The Harvest Bow. As you plaited the harvest bow, you implicated the mellowed silence in you, in wheat that does not rust, but brightens as it tightens twist by twist into a knowable corona, a throwaway love knot of straw. Hands that aged round ash plants and cane sticks and lapped the spurs on a lifetime of game cocks, harked to their gift and worked with fine intent, until your fingers moved sonambulant. I tell and finger it like braille, gleaning the unsaid off the palpable. And if I spy into its golden loops, I see us walk between the railway slopes, 
into an evening of long grass and midges, blue smoke straight up, old beds and ploughs in hedges, an auction notice on an outhouse wall, you with a harvest bow in your lapel, me with the fishing rod, already homesick for the big lift of those evenings, as your stick whacking the tips off weeds and bushes beats out of time and beats but flushes nothing. That original townland, still tongue-tied in the straw tied by your hand. The end of art is peace, could be the motto of this frail device that I have pinned up on our deal dresser, like a drawn snare slipped lately by the spirit of the corn, yet burnished by its passage and still warm. So, always a, um, a wonderful poet, but I'm, I'm fond of that poem myself, um, as a personal favourite. Um, so I was over in Dublin, the August Seamus died, making a TV programme about Derry, and I'd arranged to meet the poet Paul Muldoon to interview him. He'd, he'd written a libretto about the city for the year it was a city of culture. Um, and my office at Princeton at the time was about three feet from Paul's office, um, so it was a bit odd we were meeting in Dublin, but that's what we were doing. And Seamus and I had been meant to meet the week before in Derry, but had missed each other. So um, I was to call round in Dublin and see himself and Mary. Um, but then his assistant Susie emailed to say he'd bumped his head and was in St Vincent's, uh, the hospital, as a precaution. Um, but he'd said to say that he was well, and he, he said he was less stressed than the golfers he was watching from his window, overlooking the fairway of the Elm Park golf course. I was to call around on the Sunday to see him in the hospital, but when Saturday came, I cried off, saying I'm sure he needed another visitor, like he needed a hole in the head. And then a few days later, I was back in London, and um, the sad news came he died. So it's hard to talk about poetry without quoting Seamus, since he spoke so well and so often about it. I'll just finish by quoting what he himself said about Norman McCaig, uh, the wonderful Scottish poet which I'm sure a lot of people feel about Seamus. He means poetry to me. He means poetry to me. I'll just read a short poem of my own called Silk Cut. Silk Cut is a, a brand of cigarettes. I don't think they make them anymore, but it was the brand of cigarettes my father smoked for 40 years. Silk Cut. I was five and stood beside my dad at a junction somewhere in Dublin. When I slipped my hand in his, and met the red end of a cigarette. But now our hearts are broken. We walk down to the Bray side where we can get a proper pint and his voice tears up a bit about the emptiness in the house. And we are going home, waiting at the turn for the traffic, when I find I have to stop my hand from taking his. We've also uh, got Alvi Darcy, reading for us, a, a wonderful um, Irish poet who lives in Wales now. She'll read one of her own poems and one of Seamus's. And we've got the wonderful Miriam Gamble, um, a poet from the north of Ireland who lives in Edinburgh now. So, good. Okay, thanks very much. Bye. Stink. They think you came first from Japan in packing crates hoping for mulberries, figs, and persimmons. For time to vibrate to one another come mating season, one signal longer and lower than any other. For good sidings and soffits to wander all winter where you'd never let loose the stink of coriander. First you tried Pennsylvania, then south to Florida, and north to Maine. You hitched your rides across America, dodged jumping spiders, and katydids with eyes for your eggs, met crickets, ground beetles, and earwigs keen to make you dinner. Learned to prosper on lima beans, soya beans, peaches, and peppers. One day 
my sister came and erected a blank sheet on our deck overnight, a light behind it to gather bugs. Who was she searching for? Not you, hibernating in here with us, as though here was where you'd been headed for. Until the day we turned up the heat, making you crazy, blowing your cover. If you were me, you went out still dreaming of the words you'd heard along the road, but never hitched to meaning. Asian pear and flowering dogwood, corn and cherry and apricot tree. I want to read you a poem by Seamus Heaney called The Spoon Bait. And I'm sure you know what a spoon bait is. It's um, a little metal lure for putting on the end of a fishing line. Um, it's, a, it's a lovely little thing. But in fact, when I read this poem, I never remember what a spoon bait is. I always get confused and I don't know why, but I always think it's um, one of those fortune telling fish, which hopefully you've also encountered which are just um, little fish made of cellophane and you put them in the palm of your hand and depending on how the fish curls you can discover if you have a true heart or a faithless heart which is a really important thing to know about yourself. The spoon bait. So a new similitude is given us and we say the soul may be compared onto a spoon bait that a child discovers beneath the sliding lid of a pencil case. Glimpsed once and imagined for a lifetime, risen and free and spooling out of nowhere, a shooting star going back up the darkness. It flees him and it burns him all at once. Like the single drop that Dives implored, falling and falling into a great gulf. Then exit. The polished helmet of a hero laid out amidships above scudding water. Exit, alternatively, a toy of light. Reeled through him, upstream, snagging on nothing. Thanks for listening. Hi, I'm Miriam Gamble. Um, I'd love to be at Glucksman House uh, raising a toast to Laura on her excellent win, uh, but alas, we are where we are, so instead I'm in Edinburgh. Um, I'm going to read a poem by Heaney first and then one of my own. Um, it's kind of hard to choose a Heaney. There's so many excellent poems. Um, in the end, I went for one that is um, a personal favourite of mine, but which I thought might not also have been chosen by at least five other people. Um, so it's quite a dark poem, uh, but also really beautiful, I think. It's called In Iowa. In Iowa, once among the Mennonites in a slathering blizzard, conveyed all afternoon through sleet glit pelting hard against the windscreen and a wiper's strong absolving slumps and flits. I saw, abandoned in the open gap of a field where wilted corn stalks flagged the snow, a mowing machine. Snow brimmed its iron seat, heaped each spoked wheel with a thick white brow and took the shine off oil in the black-toothed gears. Verily, I came forth from that wilderness as one unbaptized who had known darkness at the third hour and the veil in tatters. In Iowa, once, in the slush and rush and hiss, not of parted, but as of rising waters. Um, many of the poems in my own most recent book uh, are, are kind of on the dark side as well, but I've chosen uh, one of the more light-hearted pieces to read today, which is really just a, a kind of capturing of somebody else's wee moment of madness. It's called Girl with Book and Rubber Bands. 
She has a book and she's attached it to a string of rubber bands, knotted like you used to do for playing inside outside, or like you'd make a makeshift punch bowl. Bam, the book flies into the air and the people in the stalled cars turn to see it. Don't stare, our inner mothers warn. But we have never seen a girl on a crisp autumn's day operating a paperback like a missile with assorted rubber bands. What in God's names got into her head? And with our handbrakes on, with our four strokes ticking over, we watch transfixed as it buckets through the air. A car nudges into another car and no one cares. The news is like a grim stuck record. But there is this girl sending out and reeling in a book on a rubber leash. Tomorrow she will be a brat. The type to ask you in the street if you're some kind of a dick bastard. To simper, oh my God, would you look at her hair? But today she is magnificent. Today, we watch her and we like the cut of her jib more than anything as she cackles and flexes, as she sends the book cantering through the air for the solo delectation of her mate who sits on the paving stones doubled up with screaming laughter. Their bags decorate a branch, their shoes are nowhere to be seen. Many congratulations to Laura and to all of the shortlisted poets for this year's prize. Hello, my name's Catherine Heaney and I'm very glad to have been invited to contribute to this. Uh, this time last year, I was lucky enough to be in New York um, for an event in honour of my father, Seamus Heaney, as part of the Irish Arts Centre's Poetry Fest, but also for the Tom Quinlan Lecture at Glucksman Ireland House. Um, my father had a very long and happy relationship with, with Glucksman Ireland House um, and it was my very special pleasure to sit next to Tom at a lunch before last year's lecture and so I'd like to send a very special greeting to him today and to all of the Quinlan family um, and also to say uh, hello to my friends at the Irish Arts Centre um, and I very much look forward to getting back to New York when, when that's possible. In the meantime, I'm going to read a poem of my father's. It's one of the Glanmore sonnets, uh, Glanmore being the uh, house in Wicklow where our family lived in the 1970s um, and where my father continued to work. Um, and in fact, the house where I spent the first three years of my life. So these poems have a special resonance for me. This one, uh, Glanmore Sonnet 7, recalls the BBC shipping forecast, um, which, which boats use uh, crossing the, the waters around Ireland and Britain. Um, so it seems appropriate to read it and send it on its way to you across the Atlantic. Glamour Sonnet 7 Dogger, Rockall, Malin, Irish Sea Green swift upsurges, North Atlantic flux Conjured by that strong gale-warning voice Collapse into a sibilant penumbra Midnight and close down Sirens of the tundra Of eel road, seal road, keel road, whale road raise their wind-compounded keen behind the bays and drive the trawlers to the lee of Wicklow. L'Etoile, Le Guillemo, La Belle Hélène nursed their bright names this morning in the bay that toiled like mortar. It was marvellous and actual. I said out loud, a haven, the word deepening, clearing, like the sky elsewhere on Minchie's, Cromarty, the Pharaohs. Thank you very much. Hi, I'm Joe Quinlan, and I'd like to thank both John Waters and Nick Laird on behalf of the Quinlan family for putting this presentation together today. 
I'm speaking to you today from our apartment here in Greenwich Village. It's just an eight minute stroll from here over to Glucksman Ireland House. We moved here coincidentally in 1994, the same year that the house opened. It has been terrific for us. In fact, we've sort of recreated Glucksman Ireland House in a small scale way. We have Irish art, we have Irish sculpture, photography, and most of all, books many, many books from the many friends, authors in Ireland House. We have Nick Laird, of course, Karen Carson, Joe Lee and Kevin Kenny, Peter Quinn, Roger Lane, Terry Galway, Frank and Malachi McCourt, Colin McCann, John Dickerson, Jimmy Breslin, and of course, the late, great Pete Hamill. As my late mother, fellow Brooklynite, would say, God bless him. And thank goodness we still have Pete's books with us. This lecture series came about in large part because my dad started attending the Yates Summer School, which he first learned about at Glucksman Ireland House. In fact, this book, which is Seamus' first book, was autographed on his first visit to Sligo, Ireland. I also have another very treasured book. It's from a collection, limited first edition, Eugene O'Neill, signed by himself back in the 30s. O'Neill lived actually on Lower Fifth Avenue for a period where he wrote some of his early plays and actually had them produced just off Washington Square. His parents were married just 300 yards from where I sit. His mother, maiden name, Ella, Quinlan. Her father, Eugene's grandfather, Thomas J. Quinlan. As for my Thomas J. Quinlan, my dad continues to do well living down in the Quaker run retirement community Chandler Hall down near Philadelphia. We saw him earlier today and he wanted to send a word of encouragement to all of us. Onward! It's been a tradition at all these lectures every year to have my father read and speak about a Seamus poem. We didn't think we could do that correctly this year, so we reached into the files and pulled up an excerpt that I think you'll enjoy from 2014. I'm going to read a poem by Seamus Heaney. I'm going to talk about it a little bit because that's what teachers do. <laughs> Usually, a few words of preface take about the poem takes about two minutes. The introduction takes about a half an hour. <laughs> it's really unfair, I think, sometimes to ask you to listen to someone read a poem if you don't have a copy of it. You really, sh everyone should have brought a copy with you. I checked at the door for the first ten people, and I quit because <laughs> not only did they not bring the poem, but they didn't know what. It's called a personal helicon. And the first thing, when he, the first guy said to me, what the hell is a helicon? He, had, he said it was a helicopter, I guess. <laughs> For the one or two people who, do, who don't know what a helicon is, there are now three of them. I didn't know either. If you look in his dictionary, helicon is a mountain in Greece. It's a magic mountain. It's dedicated to Apollo. And people have been going up this mountain for thousands of years to seek wisdom and to work out some artistic effect. Writers climb this mountain. It's, it's there today. Dancers, singers, because on top of the mountain through the years, there are supposed to be nine muses. And people, same as he, climb this mountain, as a matter of fact. And some of them go up and they perform and they, uh, on top of them, Narcissus was up there. There's a well up there, and you know the story of, of Narcissus. So this is a place, a helicon is a place where you seek wisdom and joy and happiness and salvation, I guess. And his personal helicon happened to him when he was a little boy. In Ireland, a long time ago, in Ireland and all over the world for centuries, there were actually two worlds. One was the world of kids and one was the world of adults. And kids and adults never mixed and he didn't mix in his family. 
He had the last thing they told him. The personal helicopter, uh, something only a kid could do, could handle. It's looking at used uh, wells and farms. They smell. They're dirty, and they have look have rats in them, and that's the kind of things that kids like. Their parents, and they, the, the, the first thing they tell them, first line of the poem. As a child, they could not keep me from wells. As soon as your mother says, "Stay away from the well," and you can't wait to get out, and you go over. And this is the story of him seeking some kind of salvation, looking at these. Uh, these these various wells. It's a magnificent poem, and he goes on and on and on in the poem, and describes each one as he sees it. And finally, he gets he gets to the end. He's a grown man, and he sinks back. And the question comes up: Why would a man write a poem about crummy wells? And at the the last line of the poem, I'm going to give you that first. You ready? <laughs> you better be ready. <laughs> Why do I do it? I rhyme to see myself, to set the darkness echoing. Doesn't get any better than that. That's why he wrote the poem. Now I'm going to read it. Personal Helicon. As a child, they could not keep me from wells. An old pump with buckets. Windlasses. I love the dark drop, <laughs> the trapped sky, the smells, and water weed, fungus, dank moss. As an adult, it's enough to make you vomit. Isn't it? <laughs> but this is a kid, and that's the way they, they operate. And now he describes each well. One in a brickyard with a rotted board top. I savored the rich crash where a bucket plummeted down at the end of the rope. So deep you saw no reflection in it. A shallow one under a dry stone ditch, fructified like any aquarium. When you dragged out a long roost from the soft mush. A white face hovered over the bottom. It was his face, a reflection. Others had echoes. Gave back your own call with a clean new music in it. And one was scarce. For there, out in the fern, tall foxgloves, a rat slapped across my reflection. This was his helicon, because he was a kid. And now, 50 years go by, and he writes the last few lines, wondering what happened to me, and what happens to you, and what happens to all of us. We grow up. We grow up. Now, to pry into roots, to finger slime, to stare big-eyed narcissus into some spring. This is beneath all adult dignity. Isn't that sad? Beyond all adult dignity. And he analyzes, why do I do it? I rhyme to see myself to set the darkness echoing. Amen. As you just heard in that excerpt, Greenwich Village is filled with sounds. Church bells, motorcycles, boom boxes, you name it. We decided to leave it in. I spent too many years in public television not to come back just one last time and say a few words about both Glucksman and the Irish Art Center. These are two extraordinary institutions 
run by very, very special people. And I want to acknowledge from the Quinlan family that several of these very special people have had deep personal losses during the last few months, during this very difficult period. We want to express our deep condolences to all of them. And we also had a thought leading into this holiday season that instead of jamming up your package room and your mailboxes with yet another Amazon gift box, you might consider financially supporting these institutions, the Art Center, Luxman, the Irish Rep, you name it, because they were valuable before, they're valuable now, and they'll be even more valuable going forward. So please consider their support. Thank you.